Hello everyone and welcome back to the Goose Den episode 2, the show where I give you guys a chance to talk about whatever you want to talk about. But first, we're going to talk about what I want to talk about. Today we have Jay Tree, Shark, and Gates. So uh, let's go around and introduce ourselves, starting with Jay Tree. Jay Tree, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, man. I'm GDA for Ethereal, and um, I'm 20 years old, currently finishing up something school related, and I'll see what I'll be doing for the future. Probably game design. But for the rest, I'm just chill guy. Unless you're an ass, then the same will be. Like. <laughs> <laughs> Who's your favorite uh, Paragon hero, J Tree? Uh, definitely Aurora. I uh, always loved her. Sadly, she got her utility removed and latest nerfs, and then I just stopped enjoying her. Yeah. Oh, poor Aurora. She was a roller coaster ride of being good and bad. So yep. let's, uh, let's move on to Shark. How you doing, Shark? Tell us a little bit about yourself, man. Uh, hello, I'm Sharks, and I'm doing fine, thank you. Um, I'm from Germany, and I want to say that in the beginning, so just that you are prepared. And that's also why I'm really honored to be on here. And yeah, um, I started playing Paragon on Monolith, uh, which I'm pretty ashamed of, actually, because I saw the game in early alpha state on, uh, in the PS store. And then I started playing it and just didn't know what I should do in this game because I didn't know MOBAs at all. And so I deinstalled it and checked it later again and then I knew what a MOBA is and so I got into it. Right on. Yeah, there's no shame in that. No shame at all, man. Um, <laughs> who's your favorite hero? Uh, definitely Gideon. Uh, I just love his interstellar theme and throwing these rocks and uh, opening a black hole in his ultimate is just absolutely phenomenal and I love it. You'd think that would kill somebody, right? Dropping a giant <laughs> meteor right on top of their head? <laughs> well, no, they just shake it off and roll on. <laughs> 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 Alright, and then our next guest is Gates. How you doing, dude? Hey, what's up, man? I'm doing great. Um, a little bit about myself. I started playing Paragon back in Legacy around the time that Chimera came out. Been a long time fan. It was my first MOBA. I tried to leave before that for like a few days and I didn't really like it. Tried this game out with a couple of buddies that introduced me to it and I loved it ever since. Yeah, right on. Yeah, it's uh, definitely not League, right? <laughs> oh, definitely not. Definitely not. Favorite hero? Grim.exe. It's a Ooh. rare one. Yeah, yeah so it um, it's an interesting one. Nobody ever really played it until he got buffed big time when he got his ult in 15 seconds. So like, before then my friends used to call me the Unicorn. Because it was rare to have a Grim main. <laughs> yeah, it is a little rare. <laughs> so uh, let's move on. Let's move on to the icebreaker. As just like we did last time, shot out of a cannon. You got three of them. Marry one, fuck one, kill one. Decker, Aurora, Yin, J Tree, go. <laughs> fuck, man. I'm, I'm becoming brainless slowly by the day. I just like <laughs> Yin, Aurora, and Decker. I'd fuck Aurora. <laughs> I'd marry Yin. And I killed Decker. Oh, poor Decker. <laughs> you got any reasoning behind that? I'm more into Asian people. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. This really sounds terrible. Um, Aurora. Well, she was your main, right? Yeah, of course. Why not? <laughs> and Decker. Well, she doesn't. She's just a support. She's <laughs> just a support. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Shark, what do you got? Well, <laughs> I actually don't really know what to say to that, but uh, I think I would marry uh, Decker, actually just because she is a support. Um, I think that would help a lot in the marriage. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> and uh, uh, what uh, Aurora and uh, Yin, I think Aurora. Yes, uh, fuck Aurora and kill the other one. <laughs> oh, Yen. Oh, poor Yen. Gates, what do you got? I'm pretty much the same as Shark. Um, Mary Decker. You gotta have that little support in your life. Sorry to steal your line, Shark. Um, <laughs> me, uh, fuck Aurora and then kill Yen. I feel like she's got that whip. She's into the kinky shit. That ain't me. <laughs> <laughs> no, don't, don't kink shame Yen. I'm, I'm kind of on the lines with, with you guys. Uh, Decker, just she just seems like marriage material. And then uh, when it comes down to Aurora and Yin, like, I don't want to kill Yin, but I really would like to fuck Aurora, so I would have to go with Aurora and oh uh, kill Yin. 
<laughs> that just sounds like I'm gonna be caged for my own amusement. <laughs> <laughs> So, <laughs> she put that containment fence around the house and never let you leave. <laughs> oh, <laughs> shit. So, uh, let's move on. I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw out a topic first just to get everybody talking. Um, the next, uh, call to arms that I'm gonna do is going to be, um, kind of how they dumbed down Paragon and how all of these games should keep some complexity within their MOBA. And, uh, some examples are like, kind of like how they introduced. Heroes with lock-on abilities, they dumb down a lot of hero kits, they even dumb down the mechanics of the game to make last hitting, like, extremely simple, and just changes to the jungle, and, um, yeah, I think, uh, I, I really don't like how just simple they made Paragon. Uh, what do you guys think? Anybody have any, uh, any thoughts on that? I mean, I have some thoughts, because I can compare it to other games. <clears throat> um... But also had like a few of those changes, and they became really frustrating characters to play against, and immediately rised up. They also killed off the fun of one of my main characters. I just dropped him completely because he just got dumbed down to a thing. I think dumbing down is usually a sign of like more of like the developers don't understand the game that well or something like. I'm trying to say if it shows to me that you're making those changes because they're necessary and in my eyes they're not necessary. So it just feels kinda of strange. <laughs> I mean I'm warning it out really poorly because I haven't prepared. Yeah, no worries, man. <laughs> um yeah, I, I, I definitely see where, you, where you're getting at. They seemed to think that it was necessary to draw in new players. Because, like, I mean, the complexity of a game is fun for those that have been playing it for a long time. However, it serves as a barrier of entry to people that are new to the game. And like, like Shark, you were saying, you'd never played a MOBA before, so you didn't yes. really know how the mechanics went. And, but um, I don't think simplifying everything to the point that Paragon did was really the right answer there. Uh, Gates, what do you have to say? You have any uh, examples or anything? Um, I'm sorry. What was the question? It was about the uh, dumbing down, right? Yeah. Yeah, I was actually glad you brought that up because when they started to introduce like being able to execute minions at what was it, twenty percent health, it automatically gave you the um, kill on it. Is that right? Right. Yeah. Yep. Um, I was really not a fan of that because I was in ADC main and being able to last hit your minions is a skill that you have to have. Being able to dumb that down so that anybody can just easily get the C like the CS I think was kind of dumb. It took all the skill out. And then something else that bothered me the most was Severog's kit change. So when they made it so that you didn't have to use this Q to get stacks for him. That was just completely dumbed down his kit and the ability for him to have a skill. Those yes. are the main points that I brought up. Stuff like that kind of separates the good players from the bad players. And like, especially with the minion thing, that, that was one of the things that separated good ADCs from bad ADCs. Or the ones that could get those last hits while still participating in the game. And, th you know, de that definitely a good example with Severog. That was definitely something that separated the good and bad Severogs. was knowing exactly how to stack that jungle camp so that they could get one Q and get several stacks off of it. Uh, mm -hmm. Shark, what do you have to say on the topic? Well, I think making it uh, easier to get the last hits was a big mistake in terms of complexity because um, I always felt like last hitting is a skill you just have to learn and practice. And if you do this, you get uh, obviously better on it, uh, on it at it. And well, I've did, I've done this and got better. And in the end, I was, I feel, uh, felt like I got an advantage uh, over my enemies. And with this new mechanic, I thought like this advantage is gone, and so uh, I didn't like it. Yeah, there's just a lot of things uh, like um, Murdoch's kit. Murdoch just came became just all all you had to do was run around and shoot with Murdoch. You didn't have any other sort of abilities that you really needed to do. Just run run around shoot people. Hit somebody with Long Dong of the Law, and that was it. And that. Uh. <clears throat> you like discuss more about last setting? Because to like remove that mechanic, the interaction between the lane, between duo was like, 
also simplified in a way, because I'm gonna pressure someone for last setting when it's significantly easier to do so. Okay, yeah, I see what you're saying, yeah. Like, for instance, like, let's say you go up for a last hit, and I see my own minion, oh, it's low health, I see that you're going in a last hit, and I just try to pressure you, so you don't get a last hit for free, basically. Right, yeah. Oh, no, that's probably one of the biggest biggest mistakes they made there, was the, um, that change to the minions. I, I disliked it a lot as well. Like, last setting for me is just like, I'm playing a little mini game basically. And it gets me stronger. Like, yeah, it might get redundant as a while, but it's still part of a MOBA after all. Very true. So let's, uh, let's move on to Shark. Shark, do you have a you have a topic that you want to discuss today? Uh, yes, of, sh of course. Um, the topic I want to talk about is uh, toxic predictions ruining the game. So uh, I thought of this because I saw Britic uploaded a video called uh, Can Paragon 2 Die Before It Is Born or something like this. And he used the thumbnail with Howitzer having crosses over his eyes and the word dead question mark in caps lock written. And this kind of didn't seem right to me. Uh, I watched the whole video, it is about 10 minutes and he got some pretty good points about people should regulate their expectations and trying to tell them they shouldn't be mad when the game comes out and isn't that developed yet, as people might have thought. Pretty similar to how it was with Predators, uh, Predecessors Alpha and so. But that's not what I want to talk about now. Um, what bothered me was uh, the clickbait, if you may call it like this, pretty said that at the start as well. Definitely it is uh, drawing attention and because there are people who didn't watch the whole video and listen to all points or just saw the thumbnail, uh, for sure they might get the wrong idea about it and drew most of the information from the title and the thumbnail. And this way I think rumors or just the thought, the idea to uh, spread, start to spread that core or prede predecessor won't be a thing, which will make it harder for the studios to grow population and player base in future, or just making people, people have less interests, uh, interest in it. And it's like with any other game as well, and just like also it was with Paragon. If someone with a bigger audience spreads information like this, uh, people will follow. And Casbridic, I thought, is a supporter of the studios. It seemed a bit con uh, contrastive to me. But if you watch the whole video, you know what's up. Um, but main topic is people in general being toxic and spreading rumors, making the game die. Paragon got a huge shitstorm uh, in the past, and this definitely, uh, definitely led to its shutdown as well. Um, may the critique be reasonable or not. I think it was, although I enjoyed the game in every state I played it. But I would like to hear your opinions on uh, how to prevent people from losing interest in creating a hype in an appropriate way. Well, I think uh, I think they're mainly going about it the right way. They're releasing, you know, at least small tidbits of information as we go along. That kind of keeps people hyped up for the game somewhat. Um, I did see that video that you were, you were talking about, and yeah, the. The actual meat and potatoes of the video was very positive and um, a very good message. But yeah, he did admit at the very beginning that he did a kind of a clickbait thumbnail and clickbait title. And maybe he should not have done that. But, you know, people can do do whatever they want and then we can just do whatever we feel necessary. But um, and I've said this a lot of times, too. There there are, you know, a lot of people just, you know, being very negative about the games and uh I, th I think it's less people than you think, because it's always the squeaky wheel, you know what I mean? That's the one that you hear. You don't hear the other three wheels that are that are moving <laughs> along just fine. Um, what do you guys think? Yeah, that's an interesting uh, topic for discussion. I uh, I watched that video too, and I can understand like from the uh, the thumbnail and like the title that it can seem kind of negative and people might not like look into like the actual video and just take away the thumbnail saying oh no paragon 2 is just gonna die but um i kind of understand why he did that though there hasn't been much news coming about so you kind of need to draw some interest for a video in some way but i thought the overall message of like just hold on to your expectations don't have super like this game's gonna be just like paragon um going into it and the thing about these games i think they're doing a good job like they're giving a lot of information out and uh, giving us all the steps they're taking like during the development process which you don't see in a lot of um, game development 
most studios, like big studios, won't really like disclose any information unless if it's like an actual trailer before the game comes out. They don't take a lot of community input into their game development. And I think the ability for these studios to be able to include so much community feedback is keeping people drawn into it because it feels like they're actually making an impact on the game. Yeah, very good point. That that is definitely one way they can keep keep things rolling. Uh, I think there's there's a point where they need to kind of stop doing that and and right, just focus yeah. on the game. But yeah, that's it's definitely it, it's very unprecedented. I mean, the, this whole situation is unprecedented, really, with Paragon dying the way it did, and then you know, Epic pretty much giving away all all the all the characters and everything for free, and so people are able to recreate the game we love it's it's a very weird unprecedented situation and uh it is very nice that these indie companies are being so very transparent um so uh, jtree works for um for ethereal and uh mm -hmm. ethereal they, they've actually released a lot of information but not nearly as much as say um predecessor or uh core and i think that's actually kind of a good thing in a way because they're it's more along the lines of the expectations that you would have for a gaming company, and um, and once they do release, a, you know, some significant information about the game, some like actual gameplay, I think it'll have a lot more impact. And uh, once they can get driving with that, that's uh, that's something that they can carry on with. Um, is that is that true, J Tree? I mean, um, well, to a degree, of course. I mean, we haven't released a lot of stuff yet, but um, we're kind of like focusing like a lot of on developing at the moment. So the focus is less more on sharing out. I mean, we're still working on it, of course. We're kind of busy at the moment on development a lot instead of showcasing stuff off. That will surely come at a later date. But right now, the important is a lot on development of the game. Make sure that there's a good launch of it. Because a first impression is really important for a game, right? That that's kind of what happened to Phoenix Rising too. Um, it, I mean, they're doing the same thing right now. They're they're just not releasing any information at all until they have a very good, solid final product, and it's because they released so much information at the uh, at the beginning, so that it was like a huge letdown when the when the company kind of split there a little bit. So. There's a uh, there's 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 good and bad to all this transparency, but I think overall overall I, I, I like it. I like the uh, I like the transparency we're getting from Meta Buff and Obeta. Um, Gates, uh, what what topic did you have for us? My topic for discussion is the item system and how they're going to be able to balance cards that give just stats versus cards that give active abilities or passive abilities. So back in Legacy, they focused a lot on cards and upgrading the cards with um, different stats. So like you could build, you could have a card, then you could upgrade it with like power, uh, physical ability, armor, etc. And then once they transitioned to, well, actually before B42, when they got to about like version 38 maybe, they started to incorporate not only those cards where you just had like um, cards with stats and then you could build those up, but then also cards that had certain passive abilities or active abilities like purity sensor there was one that ticked away health i forget the name of it but then once they got to b42 their main focus was like every single card is going to have an ability so there were so many cards that had abilities versus cards that didn't give a lot of stats or of the ability to build a lot of stats so my just topic for discussion is how do you think that these uh games should balance their item system so you have a good amount of cards or items that give stats versus cards and items that give passive or active abilities? Uh, I personally think that it's going to be like a, a learning process within the alpha. They'll st I think they should start their alphas with just stats, just stat cards, so they can get a good baseline, and then slowly start bringing in these activatables, see how they affect the game, and then balance them <coughs> off of uh, off of that. <coughs> um, what do you guys think? When it comes down to like an item, there is of course, um, for instance, in League of Legends, um, every item consists of upgrade components. Basically, um, the cost of those upgrade components allows you to calculate, okay, how 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 cost effective is this item? For instance, like usually completing an item usually nets you up 
with like a higher amount of value for your gold, plus a passive, of course. But there's also scenarios in, for instance, Sunfire Cave, if I recall correctly, um, which is like another 100% gold cost efficiency, but its passive is so strong that it makes up for it. That's what, like, usually it's the amount of value you get out of your buck and the passive that comes in it and how much value itself has. That's what it comes down to items. So knowing that by base, when looking at the cost of like Paragon, like mostly the ability defense item, I bought them mostly for their stats because they were very strong. But they also usually had a decent actor. One of them I think was like to take less magic damage, like 80% or something, I don't recall correctly. Anyways, when it comes down to balancing these items, it's like mostly looking into like the upgrade components and like how much that costs. And then the end result. And it's just gonna take a lot of time to gradually scale up everything so I just work both. Yeah, that, that that's a very good point. A lot of times, like, um, and it was kind of hero dependent if it was actually worth it. Like, you know, six six of those points into power, is it worth those six points to get like stinger boost, which was the one wherever whenever you activate an ability, you got extra damage on your next basic attack. Like, um, for Steel, it wasn't really worth it. For Crunch, it was very much worth it. So, yeah, it's, it's going to be a hard thing for them to balance. Uh, Shark, did you have anything to add? Uh, well, I definitely agree on that with you, but I thought, like, um, the f the first cards you could use uh, where you need needed to put one Agility or Intellect into, uh, you always just had an effect, no stats or something like this, which was um, kind of an interesting new feature. And I kind of liked it because you could uh, decide whether you want to have this effect or this. It is It was not, no just um, uh, stacking up your health or your attack speed or something like this. And uh, in case of uh, value, I think you can also or you could also use higher tier cards uh, which cost a lot of gold or whatever and just have an effect uh, if it is worth it compared to another card which gives you just uh, a lot of damage or something like that. Yeah, did they just they did everybody just needs to definitely keep an eye on those activatables because some of them ended up being ridiculous in Paragon and they were not balanced well. Um, I think that's kind of what you were getting at, Gates. Is that right? Yeah. So, um, like, once they got to, like, B42, they started to have, like, all these crazy um, abilities. Some of those cards were not balanced at all. Like, I thought Paragon was probably in its best state item balance wise, was probably around, like, B38, where they started to integrate some more um, actives and passive abilities. Not to the degree where they were broken. I think they had maybe one that was broken. It was that one that ticked over time. It was Tainted Magic or something like that. Uh, Tainted Magic applied a... Um, it was a health-based percentage ticking damage. Yeah. W yep, one, one ability hit. Yeah, that's the one. Um, think... Sorry, what? No, sorry. Continue. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, so I thought they were probably at their best state item balance-wise there. Because they had the ability for people to just develop stats and at the same time have a few cards that were um, good abilities instead of having too many that provided like broken abilities or otherwise yeah and those cards also kind of like what shark was saying you, you got to choose what you wanted to build on those cards due to the way the card system was was designed which was also nice uh jaytree yeah, yeah Jay bad? Uh, the card system certainly is something what what made paragon stood out to me and i do also agree with like the stats in V38, like, where the stats are being integrated. I think it was the best moment of Paragon when it came to their card design. It was certainly that... Well, it was grindy, of course, but... It certainly kept me interested in the game. And it was honestly a lot of fun just making my own deck and stuff and just feeling personalized. Something that I can't have with any other MOBA on the market right now. Very true. Uh, Shark, you had something to add? Uh, yeah, I would like to throw in um, because of the card system. The uh, um, uh, there were some effects on some older cards or these items. Um, 
for example, when you killed someone, you uh, got into the sh uh, or got invisible for a few seconds, uh, which I thought was pretty OP at the time, and I really liked to use this card because it also gave you uh, some power. And well, with the new card system, we got uh, Shadow Dancer, for example, uh, which gave also power and but it was an active and you could just activate it whenever you uh, wanted to do so and you could um, because of this uh, you could play characters who uh, haven't been designed to be to be played like this uh, in a way which was kind of uh, inappropriate like countess was a uh, hella OP uh, at some points when you just use Shadow Dancer on her, you could just instantly kill someone, uh, sneak uh, up behind them, use all your abilities on him, and he's just dead. And this is something uh, you could prevent uh, by seeing her uh, in the earlier uh, stages of the game if she had not this uh, active card, but then it wasn't, it just wasn't possible anymore. Or like Steel, who is a pretty uh, tanky guy or and pretty slow moving if you just used uh, this card um, with that you could portal yourself uh, forward I uh, blink uh, or something like that it was called and yeah it, that just made him kind of not the character he was designed to be yeah you're kind of right um, all the activatables sort of kind of threw hero balance out the window like um like steel and Richter were, you know there were tanks you were supposed to know they were coming there they were supposed to be an imposing presence but like Richter with a shadow dancer come on <laughs> you get hooked yeah, out of absolute nowhere the ball before back speed in the mouth come on <laughs> yeah right <laughs> stop whipping the shit out of people <laughs> Well, for example, there was the purple buff the, that already made you invisible, but you could um, calculate when somebody could be invisible, or you could see if somebody stole the uh, river buff, but the table uh, uh, of all cards of people and see, oh, he got Shadow Dancer, and then he was like, uh, he could be anywhere. Yeah, and it was a constant threat, as, like, that's, that's a really good point with purple buff. You could actually call it out if purple buff was meant, like, hey, somebody took purple, watch your ass, you know? But you only had to watch your ass for about 30 seconds, um, whereas with Shadow Dancer, it was just a constant threat in the back of your mind. Ugh. Screw that. Exactly. Screw that. <laughs> That's true, that card sucked. Doesn't remind, <laughs> remind me of that other card, but, like, if you stood still, you would become invisible, and, like, and you would build up damage. And when you move, like, you would release the burst of damage. I think I ran it in a Chimera meme deck and, like, camped the enemy gold buff. <laughs> so you just stood there, invisible with Chimera, building up power. <laughs> and just pr press my ult, and the ADC would instantly lose, like, two-thirds of her HP. <laughs> That's pure genius. I've never thought about that. That's oh, unbelievable. It's messed up. I love it. <laughs> I mean... So you have a card that you're gonna stand still. Where are going? Where is the ADC gonna go the most? The gold buff, of course. I mean, the card was okay with stats, but it was just some meme there. That's all about it. <laughs> oh yeah, for sure. I know what card you're talking about. I use this card also, and I think this one was actually okay balanced because you needed to stand still and uh, or. You uh, needed uh, 10 seconds or so to build up the whole damage. And if the enemy saw you just going invisible and he looks at the table and sees, ah, oh, you have this card, then he just knew where you are and could uh, either go a big uh, circle around you or he would just uh, shoot your instant in your face. But if they didn't see you, though. <laughs> yeah. It's definitely more balanced than Shadow Dancer, I think. Not a card that fixed my attention is Dune Winds. I like running around the map at 7 HP. <laughs> Literally just... <laughs> Gates, you should know all about Dune Winds being a good Oh, main. absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Dune Winds, Nitro Boost. Those are, those are the cards, man. <laughs> well, as fun as those cards were, I think they ruined the game a little bit. <laughs> ah, maybe I a mean, little bit. Kind of. I mean, it, it's not really viable. 
But it makes up for a hell of a lot of laughs if it works properly. <laughs> yeah, right. Absolutely. Let's uh, move on to J Tree. The final topic. What you got for us, man? Um, I have a topic about balance, and it comes down to data. Um, when it came to Paragon, you saw a lot about like win rate and stuff, and that they balanced around it. How do you guys feel about balancing around data and how much value it should have? when it comes down to designing your game. Uh, I guess it depends on where you're getting the data from. Because, I mean... I mean, let's say just win rate. Because, um, cause, I mean, yeah, like, win rate... Like, Chimera's win rate was astronomical in, like, silver, but it wasn't nearly as high in diamond. So that kind of throws off how good Chimera was, you know what I mean? So I think it kind of depends a little bit where you get your data from. Like how you look at the data. Yeah, that's a very good point. Because um, Paragon would always talk about how they're using their data to balance the game. And sometimes you see these changes and you're like, all right, what data were you looking at? Because like I'm playing games and Chimera is having no presence. Why would you need to nerf him? Versus like if you're looking at Bronze, he's just a beast winning probably like 60% or something like that. Who knows what his actual win rates was. But it all depends on where you, if you're... Uh, balancing from bottom up or top down and personally I think top down is the way to go I think also data brings a lot of issues with it for instance um, let's say you have an unpopular character you have almost no data for it so how are you going to balance around it exactly just don't balance around data that simple like well if you don't balance around data then what, what do you balance around I think it's mostly balancing around I think it's still a source of info, but I don't think, I think you should take it really with a grain of salt because it's like, for instance, this piece of data can show me, okay, this character's broken, but it won't tell me why it's broken. Okay. What, I what is, like data is never going to show me perfectly how someone moves, how someone plays the game, etc. Because for instance, someone might play Kamara like, a tank or something. I'm gonna find out. Uh, it just there's experience. I think is a much better way to like balance the game around and just ask like just communicate with your pro players and etc. Like, what do they think about the state of the game? Like that. That yeah, that's a very good point. Um, you know, and and Gates hit upon that as well as balancing top down instead of bottom up instead of making things balancing things around the new player experience balance things exactly. around experienced players that actually know what exactly. they're doing and then we come back to the first topic and that's dumbing down the game you're not going to affect the top player base so why should you do it shark what do you have to add well i think this is kind of a, a harsh topic for me um it is clearly hard to uh, um, do something like this, but uh, the pro players are less or few people. Um, that's just how it is, and they they know how to play the game, or they know what uh, or they know what parts uh, you have to focus on. They know all the different characters' abilities and po possibilities you can do in the game. And new players uh, kind of just want to have fun. I mean, pro players also want to have fun, but uh, in a more professional way, I would say. So the pro players are kind of um, saying or uh, trying to show the direction a game should take. And the other players uh, may just go with it and have fun while playing it. But... Um, Developing a game in the interest of the new players, of the new players who aren't experienced, isn't uh, the best thing to do, I think. Yeah, it also kind of leads into uh, something I always try and hit on, is uh, you get you always get the guys that are solo queue that want to play what the, pro, the, the comps that pro players do, and it just doesn't work in solo queue play, because... Of course, of course you know, it doesn't. <laughs> you're not with a team that that has been practicing together and knows all the strategies, but people expect I mean, everyone else to play like that. So I think balancing that needs to be taken into account too. Whenever you're looking at top down balancing is, you know, maybe take a look at some of the solo queued top 
top players as opposed to the you know the team top players. And that could all kind of be resolved with a ranked system and a team ranked system and everything like that too. Of course, and it's like when it comes down to when you copy a pro, like things that you, you're gonna not not like you're gonna missing a lot of information on like copying. For instance, why is he building this item in this situation? Like how does he exactly play, etc. Like you're missing out on so much stuff. And there's a lot of room to make mistakes then. Exactly. Like for instance, like I oh I built a damage item when I should have bought a defense item in this situation. It's like Balancing is always going to be a questionable topic because a game is going to evolve and your balance is going to have to evolve with it. That's how it is because like, it's like saying like, "Hey, you need to know how to play your game and also know how, how also know um, how it is meant to play." For instance, when it's, to take to give an example, um, Rainbow Six Siege and uh, its early first development phases. Um, like the developers had kind of like a stationary um, gameplay plan, but as it turned out, the players find out that that's not an effective way to play, and that's why also one of the current characters is kind of a meme because it does not work in the current way the game is played. Yeah, um, some... that's that's a good point. I mean, who, the developers need to play their own game. Yeah, <laughs> I think that's course. It's another problem I mean, with Paragon. Yeah, I don't believe they play their game a lot at all. Like, it baffles me that, like, <laughs> you have so much, so you can take so much sources yet that are actually more useful than data, yet it seems like you use mostly data. Very good point. That's, good. that's not that's, a topic that's... I've ever thought of. You saw that uh, community uh, soccer from Paragon or Meta uh, Epic Games, and they, uh, that one guy just told them about Grax being able to one shot people with his ultimate and this one car uh, with death crawler and they just suddenly realize oh my god they fucked up <laughs> yeah oh I, god i didn't watch the community think... quarters a lot i usually got about five minutes into them got pissed and stopped watching them yeah <laughs> i couldn't stand him like there was that i forget which guy it was on there that Cam. ran that was on the Cameron, the man with the socks comes out like hey, I'm just... Cam, yeah, yeah the guy with the swag socks in his hand i was just like i couldn't I was stand laughing that guy. Like, it was hilarious on the stage like, the way gives a fuck god, about his socks so Fix the goddamn game. <laughs> Nobody cares about socks. Oh my god, so true. <laughs> We've brought that up on the channel before a few times. <laughs> I don't. I, I don't know. I, I kind of find it hard to be mad at any of those guys that were like on the community corner, like Mooney and Cam Winston and all that. Like, like it was definitely. Oh, I couldn't be mad at those guys. The executive Doing leadership. A favor. But... When you do, when you play when you design the game, actually play. It. And don't talk about socks where you need to do stuff that's more. On <laughs> <laughs> Very good point. I think. Well, I think that's about going to wrap it up. Unless you guys had anything else uh, you wanted to talk about, and uh, if not, we'll just move on to plugs. Uh, J Tree, you got anything you want to plug? Nope. Uh, Gates, you got like a YouTube channel, Twitch, or anything like that you want to plug? Um, no, I don't make YouTube videos or stream, but I will give a shout out to one of my buddies that does stream, Spartacus TTV. He streams Apex, League, I think some other games. Um, give him a follow. He's really fun to listen to. He's super fun guy. Give him a follow. I, mean, I could plug it's real, of course. There you go. That's <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's there a you good go. idea to do. Great plug, game. Plug up the real. <laughs> yeah. Shark. I know Shark has a YouTube channel. I don't know if you got a Twitch or not. Yeah, <laughs> fuck up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I only have a YouTube channel. Um, I upload Paragon Cinematics, Montages, Gameplays, Edits, and also started to upload uh, Call of Duty and Smite content recently. So if you're into this, uh, I would be very glad if you would like to check out my channel. Yeah, the, yeah his, his cinematic edits are very cool. I've, I've told you guys this a million times, but go check them out. <laughs> So I think that's going to be that's going to do it for uh, this episode, episode two of the Goose Den. I uh, appreciate everybody coming out. Hope you guys enjoyed Wait. this. Oh, oh, we got we got and more. I plug my stuff still because I didn't know what the meeting was. Like I'm really sleepy. Go but for it, J Tree. You do your thing. Anyways, um, I'm currently GDI. I work for Atrial. We're currently developing MOBA. I mean, we currently have a community Discord. You can go check out. We have stuff in the announcements. Um, you're you're always free to tag me. I'll be available quite a lot of time, unless I'm walking, of course. But, yeah. 
There you go. If, if you take a look, say, enjoy the ride. If you decide to join. Yep, hit up Ethereal, everybody. It's the one. It's the one I'm probably the most excited for. It's a uh, definitely a good looking game. Absolutely, looking forward to it. Same here. But all right, yep, that's gonna that's gonna do it for this week's the Goose Den uh, episode two. Appreciate everybody coming out. If you guys enjoyed it, let me know that you enjoyed it, and uh, you know, hit hit that like button, subscribe if you want to see more. But for now, this is the Man Goose and the Goose Den signing off. You guys. Have a good one. Man, goo!